we discovered this trick a long time ago of technology to multiply what we're able to do. And so we can do more than before. You know, your body is 100 watts of power and that's all you have. But with technology, you multiply that and you, you make it worth work a lot more. And so technology has this habit of, of growing over time, um, perhaps forever. Uh, it, it will only it will only ever cap out if there's a limit to human knowledge, and I'm not sure that there is. And so that's the first part of what I think. And then the second part is that I think that people on the whole are good. More people want to build than destroy. I think we know that because I don't think we ever would have made it this far if most people wanted to destroy. And so if over time technology empowers us and most people work for good, then mm -hmm. that implies to me that someday we'll solve all technical problems. There are a lot of problems that aren't technical, don't get me wrong, but ones that are purely technical, and I think there's a lot of them, we'll live to see the end of. It seems to me that um, as long as we've kind of had people, we've people have dreamed of a, of a world without hunger and poverty and all of the rest. And th there was never enough of the good stuff to go around. And so people dreamed of these utopias, a word that means no place. It doesn't exist. It's just a dream. And I think that we're the first people that can actually deliver on it because we learned this trick. We can multiply what we're able to do. We can feed everybody. We can do all of the rest. And so then you have to say, well, what, what comes next after that? Once, when we all wake up in a world, we can't imagine being any better than the world we have today. Then I think you have to look up at the sky and, and see, I think, a universe that looks like it has a lot of room for us to expand into. My favorite, the universe's big analogy is if you take a grain of sand and put it on your fingertip, and then you hold your fingertip out at arm's length and look at that piece of sand, it's blocking your view of 30,000 galaxies. So that tiny speck of sand is keeping you from seeing 30,000 galaxies beyond that. And every one of those galaxies has 100 billion planets. I mean, 100 billion stars. And so I would love to think someday there'll be a billion planets, each with a billion people on them, all empowered to um, to achieve their their maximum potential. I know you've talked a bit about conscious computers, conscious AI. Can you define a little bit the difference? What What is AI? What What's the difference between consciousness and intelligence? And do you think we'll get to conscious AI? Everybody can agree we divide AI into two large buckets. Well, one is uh, narrow AI, and that's what we know how to do today. And that's a, a computer program that can do one thing, like um, play chess, spot spam in your inbox, or what have you. It can do one thing. And we know how to do that. And when you hear Elon Musk or other folks say, I think AI is an existential threat. They're not talking about that. They're talking about the second bucket, and that is an artificial general intelligence. It's an AI that is as smart and versatile as a human. You can ask it, what should I get my spouse for Christmas? And then you could ask it, uh, what's uh, paint me a painting and write a poem and make tea or whatever. And it would do it. It would figure it out if it doesn't know how. And that's a technology we don't know how to build. And if you ask people in the industry when we'll have it, the answers vary from five to 500 years, which is meaningless. It's like if you dropped your dry cleaning off and they said it'll be ready in five to 500 days, it's like it doesn't tell you anything useful at all. So the technology people are afraid of is this general intelligence, and that's the one we don't know how to build. If you were to ask, if, when I ask people on my show, do you believe we can build this general intelligence? Virtually everyone says yes. And if you dig down as to why, people in the Bay Area who work in AI almost all share a single premise, and that is that humans are machines. And so the logic is simple. You are a machine. Your brain is a machine. Your mind, whatever that is, is a machine, is mechanistic. And, and nothing in you breaks the laws of physics. And so if you are nothing but a machine, then someday we'll build one. And when we build it, we'll make it better and better and better. That's it. And so I ask people, you know, do you think people are machines? And the vast majority on the show say, 
yeah, I mean, like, what else would we be? But what's interesting is when I was writing uh, The Fourth Age, my publisher, who lives in New York, completely out of that world, my editor, wrote in the margin, do you really think anybody honestly thinks that? And it's like, everybody I know thinks that. So I put a survey up on my own website and I said, do you believe you're a machine? Or do you think you're an animal, which is kind of a machine with life? Or do you think you're a human, which is some an animal with something else? And only 15% of people say they're machines. So most of the world doesn't have this mechanistic reductionist viewpoint of, of humanity. And therefore, it's highly dubious, I think, that you can build a general intelligence unless we're machines. Now, there's also this idea of consciousness. Now, people say we don't know what that is. That isn't exactly true. We know exactly what consciousness is. We just don't know how it is that people are conscious. So what is it? It is um, the experience of being you. So you can feel warmth. A computer can measure temperature. Like think of the difference between those two things. A computer can measure temperature. You feel and experience warmth. Whatever that delta is, that's what consciousness is.